Hello, ladies and gentlemen around the world. Today we have Colin, Colin Stockert on for the second round. I was thinking of inviting him for other topics, for example, carnivore productivity, but another topic came on itself. Well, everyone is talking about uh, Elon's offer to buy Twitter. And I tweeted something some time ago and uh, Colin reacted to it. Maybe it's a good idea that I read the tweet. And then we will talk about that and we will make a quick discussion about yep. it. Yeah, so it's loading. So this is my tweet. Before you get your hopes any higher, remind yourself that Elon is the same guy who dissed Bitcoin in the, in the hope of pumping a shitcoin. And by the shitcoin, I mean, well, uh, Dogecoin, Dogecoin, whatever the, uh, the hell it is. So we'll start from here and you can now uh, start your argument and your reaction to this tweet. Okay, so yeah, I mean, you're seeing this a lot in the Bitcoin community. You know, you have the maximalists that are just hardcore, like this is the only way there is. Let's all basically think this way and anybody that doesn't think this way, we attack them. And they have a lot of good points. I mean, because most of what they're saying is true, right? I think there's a few things worth discussing and thinking about, because I've been thinking about this a lot when it comes to public figures. It's like how quickly a public figure is attacked if they say something you don't agree with. And I'm thinking to myself, like how many other people on planet earth do you agree with hundred percent? Probably zero. To be honest, I know yeah. that's true for me because I'm my own unique person with my own unique thoughts and perspectives. And I have a lot of friends to which we don't agree on certain things. I have some friends that we literally don't even talk politics because I know it would devolve very quickly. So I'm like, we don't even go there, but that's fine because still love them. Right. So it's just one of the, it's one of those byproducts of having a public image is like people pick size and they, you know, they, they hear worship and it's, it's like they have confirmation bias, you know? And so Elon is no different. He's just just a dude. And uh, when it comes to Bitcoin, crypto and things like that, like he's also a guy like, that likes to mess around, make jokes. And I think a lot of his foray into like Dogecoin is just like a big joke and even a little bit of a troll at times. Right. Uh, the problem is some people do take it seriously and some people do try to invest in that way. But again, this is actually a tweet I thought about the other day that I wrote to somebody. Um, the perspective of Bitcoin maximalism is kind of like attack anything that's not Bitcoin, call everything a scam, because that's how we're going to protect people. There's a problem with that thesis, though. It's not that the thesis is wrong, because I do believe most of the things are scams, or at least their securities pretending to be decentralized when they're not or whatever. And I have as much hatred for grifters and people just trying to pump their own bags and pump and dumps. I, I can't stand it as much as any other maximalist, right? The problem is, though, everybody has to learn the hard way, right? They, we have to learn with our own skin in the game. We have to really, and for most people, learning is like losing money or getting pumped and dumped. Nothing a Bitcoin maximalist on Twitter is going to like make it funny you. Like no amount of that is going to prevent somebody from trying to make a quick buck and then, and then failing and then learning, right? Like we're not protecting people from that. So it's like, there's multiple points and like, it's good to at least maybe put the criticism out there. But I think some people, they don't leave room for letting people figure it out for themselves and for the learning that goes with that. And like, even with Elon, the example was, is like his thinking on Bitcoin has evolved and he also has the incentive to not evolve certain parts of his thinking related to power use, right? Uh, so like there's biases and incentives for him in that way. And honestly, like it took me a hundred hours to really get this Bitcoin this way, like deep understanding and to understand proof of work and to understand what decentralized really is and then understand the history of Bitcoin and how it's immaculate creation separates it from everything. Like that is a lot of Taylor explain to me why this is like, I can understand that if his, did I, did I cut out? It's saying a little it's bit, a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So what I was saying is I can understand people that don't get into Bitcoin or they're too busy or there's just not super interesting to them. If you don't get the bug and go deep, you're not going to understand it the way we, we do, 
right? Which is why we, we become so passionate and why in a way we're kind of like Bitcoin's immune system, like Maximus. So I think we just need to consider that. We need to consider that if you want to buy NFTs or shit coins or anything like that, anything like that, like this is the way Sailor puts it. He's like, who am I to judge you for how you spend your money or on entertainment? Like, cause that's really what you're doing. It's, it's gambling, it's speculation. And for a lot of people, it's just straight up full blown entertainment, right? <laughs> like you want to go spend money and go to a concert. You want to spend money and go to watch wrestling, even though, you know, it's fake, like whatever you want to do to each his own. And the ironic thing about Bitcoin is like, we come from a, a libertarian kind of free market freedom-based perspective, yet we want to kind of shame people into not doing certain things in the free market that gives them information to be able to maybe eventually become a maximum. So that's kind of my perspective on that. Happy to take it wherever you want. Yeah, so uh, I don't have a pro uh, problem with people getting it. It took me years, maybe it took you 100 hours to get it. It took me years and seeing it go up and I not getting any more of Bitcoin and just yeah, we all made that out. mistake. We yeah, didn't buy enough. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, true. So there's a learning curve, and mm -hmm. it takes time. I agree with that 100%. And good that you pointed out the conflicts of interest uh, that Elon might have. Yep. I see many smart people who do not get it. For example, sometimes it outrages me that uh, maybe you also uh, follow Lex Friedman. That yep. he really doesn't get it, though he has interviewed with so many smart people and he has heard all these theories, Austrian econ uh, economics and everything. But still, he's asking, how about Do and Dogecoin? It, it's, it has the power of memes. I get it that Lex um, probably hasn't gone through that rabbit hole, have I, last year? How I lost you? Oh, yeah, you're back. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay, good. Uh, I can get it that um, people might need some exposure to it, some experience for me coming from a country where I was kind of unbanked. Uh, I couldn't interact with other parts of the world uh, financially. And Bitcoin, this part of Bitcoin, I really got that yeah. it gives me power. That was something unique about me and people in, this, in similar countries as I used to live. Uh, so maybe people need some exposure, some experiences, some life experiences to get it. I get that. My problem with Elon is exactly that, that he does get it. That's my perception, that he really does get it. Otherwise, he would have sold his uh, Bitcoin. Um, he wouldn't have held on to it. He's still keeping that. And at the same time, he's dissing that, that it, it um, consumes too much energy. It makes the, the earth warm, the oceans boil. Uh, that's what, um, where I take issue with Elon, that it is kind of hypocritical. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, a human with a public figure like that, with multi, with literally billions of dollars and in interests, with narrative, with marketing, with branding, like he's going to have to, like, we don't really know what he gets or doesn't get. I mean, because the reality is on climate change, he is very, you know, it's one side. It's like global warming's bad. We need to become, you know, we need to get on batteries and solar. Like that's the answer. And he ignores all of the science around sustainable, quote unquote, energy, right? Windmills, solar panels, how they're not a effective, how they have to replace all time, how to literally build them and transport them requires fossil fuels. Like, exactly. like they're not economically feasible. They live off subsidies. Like, and I've I attack. And I also understand what Elon's trying to do. And what Elon's trying to do is probably good in the long run. Maybe, maybe it's not really going to be as impactful as he wants for the climate for 100 years. Maybe it takes 500, but maybe he does accelerate us through this kind of hump where we have to economically get to a place where maybe eventually solar is somewhat profitable, right? Or where... I'm gonna let it, I'm, I have you. Am I, I back? Still have, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are still there. Yeah. Okay. So maybe he gets us to the hump where eventually, like space travel, for example, maybe eventually space travel uh, cre creates a whole new 
economy in space. And you really needed somebody like him to come in when everyone said you couldn't do it and he's just doing it. So I think maybe there is that argument to be made in the next 50 or 100 years. Maybe we won't even see that, see it, right? Um, I think he's a net good for humanity overall. And he's somebody that is interested in the future and, and he wants the future to look bright. Uh, there's a lot of you know ways to get there. There's a lot of things that have to happen before we have maybe sustainable energy. I don't even know if it's going to be through solar or wind or whatever. It might be th through something else, but maybe this stepping stone gets us there. Maybe innovation and investment comes through and then we get to something else. So it's hard to say. Uh, he's definitely doing good though for the future, right? He, and he's giving people hope. And we need people like that that are doing that. Um, as far as the point of Bitcoin to Doge, I think you could be a Bitcoin maximalist and still have fun with like altcoins if you're using them in a certain way or whatever, right? I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, for me, it's just not worth my time because like, I, I just want to own as much Bitcoin as possible. And I think when you understand that, uh, then you don't waste time on anything else, but maybe you want to speculate. Uh, maybe you don't really understand Bitcoin fully. Like, and for example, like I said, I don't think Bit or uh, Elon gets it to the point where Bitcoin is going to change the planet. I think he thinks crypto is really great. I think it's, he thinks it empowers people, but he doesn't quite understand like how it is the future sovereignty and freedom for the human species. Like he's not like on Michael Saylor level yet. Saylor gets it. Saylor is somebody that has like literally seen this truth and he cannot unsee it. And now he has to like every day of his life talk about it, right? Like, and you can tell the difference when Saylor's talking about it versus when Elon's talking about anything crypto, you know, he's like, yeah, this is cool. It's like, it'll be good. It does this, whatever, but, it, but it's not, he's not passionate about it the way he might be with like space or going to Mars or, or power or anything. So I think even on the education spectrum, there's also, there's kind of like a passion spectrum and that is correlated to the education spectrum because when you go really, really deep and you understand what it can do for humanity, when you understand how it can even reduce the power of government and the broken state and, and like defund wars and, and, and disincentivize violence, like when you understand all that, like, and you go that deep like Sailor did, and a lot of us that have been brought with him into that, because Sailor was like the guy that really, really got me in deep. To, and then I started studying economics, libertarianism, anarchism, even like everything. That was a huge, deep rabbit hole. But it's like if I was Elon running multiple billion dollar companies and I got my mission, I know what I'm trying to do. I would have never probably ventured down that rabbit hole. Right. But because I had a, a money problem, I had an inflation problem, I had cash and I needed to do something with it. And the government just printed like 10 trillion dollars at the beginning of 2020 for the you know pandemic. It's like it forced me to go deep into the rabbit hole. And then I did because I was already into Bitcoin. It was cool, but it wasn't like. I didn't really care a whole lot. I was like, yeah, maybe I'll make some money here. It's, it's like the future. But when I had money and I needed to protect it, kind of like what Sailor do with his companies, it was, it was a game changer, right? And I just don't think a lot of for them, like, because, um, or you're just too busy with your job or buying stocks or whatever, right? So it's like, I don't think he does actually get it as deeply as a lot of the true hardcore maximalists do. You know, I don't think he sees it quite yet. And something that you mentioned, uh, you, you raised the point that um, he has been a net positive for humanity. I mean, the cars that he makes, I am not much into cars, but I get that Tesla. Yeah, I'm not into cars car. either, but like, it's still, you know, it's like he's at least an innovator for, you know, other companies and, maybe there's some crazy innovation because all these other companies are pouring billions of dollars now into EV technology and battery technology. That might, there might be a breakthrough. It's still not like much. It's probably not even better than fossil fuels, to be honest, <laughs> but yeah. it could become that. So mm -hmm. for me, I'm just like, I'm optimistic. Like we need batteries. We need electric cars. That's fine. We need to keep innovating in the space. And if the markets are not incentivized to do that because everyone is just like, you know, oil and gas, fossil fuel, whatever, um, I think you could definitely stifle innovation because there's just so much damn money in fossil fuels, right? And like, it doesn't necessarily mean they're good or bad. It just means they're kind of like the monopoly on what works right now. It's the most effective thing, but we always need to innovate and think 50 years in the future or hundred years in the future, like Elon, whereas most companies, most boards, most even uh, investors, they're thinking like next quarter, next year, maybe five years from now, if they're really long-term thinkers, you know? So like, 
that's what we need more of as a species. We need to be thinking well beyond like the next quarter or what our profit's going to say next year or, you know, whatever. We need to be thinking like what's going to happen in 10 years or 20 or 50. And that's where I think Elon's greatest strength actually comes from is from look, I was thinking that long term. Uh, not, uh, actually, from my point of view, if I look at some of the billionaires, some of the uh, famous figures who have a lot of cash and uh, make a lot of money every second, if I mean, most of them are people who benefit from this crony uh, capitalism, and they are not in a real, real free market. But if I want to choose, I, I mean, I would still criticize him. I mean, Jeff Bezos, but I would say that his Amazon has brought, uh, has made it easy for me to get books. I, I have my Kindle here and he has made shipment of the goods to many parts of the wor world easy. I see that and I feel that. And it has brought down the cost of so many things down for so many people. And that is a net, net positive that I can see. But for Elon, the goals that he have, I am a kind of low time preference person, but there's a, a difference between the goals that you, you, one can achieve and the goals that one cannot achieve. And governments are so much into the goals that are unattainable or impossible to attain, for example, equality, because that is something that you'd never and never achieve uh, in this pandemic, uh, zero COVID. This is something that you would never achieve. Um, I don't disagree that it's a good idea to invest on batteries, making them more efficient. We have had a huge leap. I remember when I was a child, we had this uh, lion batteries or lithium batteries, I guess. Yep. If you charge them for some hours and you didn't use them in uh, three days, they would just right. die. And now we have, a, yeah, and we have a, our phones. It has GPS. My phone is, it's just uncomparable to the first computer I had. It was this big and right. this is this small, doesn't make any noise and runs on a battery and it lasts me the whole day. It, yeah. there has been a huge improvement and I can see that batteries can become much better, but contrary to the popular view, batteries save energy. They do not produce it. And, mm -hmm. uh, well, he is selling his car as a, something that is producing energy. Uh, just because you don't see the fo fossil fuel, fuel, you think that it's not burned for it. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that it is a bad idea. It's a great idea. It's a great opportunity to make batteries better. But his ideas of ex space exploration is just a way of uh, making unattainable claims that would never be achieved and that wouldn't, uh, to be honest, I wouldn't think that that would move us forward. Which, which well, for example, space, space exploration, I, I don't think that we would ever be able to live on Mars. I mean, uh, when we look at the agriculture and we see that the changes in the way that we, um, we ate, we lived, uh, made us prone to so many diseases. And now if you think about going to another planet and start living there, uh, something totally uh, evolutionary and inconsistent, that would be that would be really not something that we can live with. It is un, uh, an un, unattainable goal going to well, the Mars there. Hmm? Why do you think you think it's un, you think over uh... If we had 10 million years, you think we couldn't get to Mars and live there? Of course. I think that that span of uh, years, that would be attainable. But mm -hmm. so far, it is not uh, commercially and uh, financially viable. It is not commercially viable. Well, of course not. But I mean, how, mm -hmm. like, how long did it take for the iPhone? I mean, people forget that the iPhone is like 12 years old, basically. Like Obama, when Obama was being elected president, the iPhone and even Airbnb and a lot of these companies were just like just starting, right? So if you think about that, it took Homo sapiens 300 plus thousand years to go from, you know, fire cooking food to this, right? If you take it back even further, it took planet earth, or you could say nature or just like whatever this reality is. It took that six, I think the, I think it's like 6 billion years maybe to go from like a, 
just a, a floating rock to life to single celled organisms. And then we started out as fish and then we got on land and then we were walking and the eyeball developed like whatever. So it's like, it's very hard for us because we're a little blip of time to think on that, that kind of grand scale. Like we can't fathom what a million years is like. We literally can't fathom it. But we do have some good estimates about how long like mammal evolution took, primate evolution, you know, to humans, et cetera, and Homo sapiens sapiens, which is the only chimps and bonobos that we related to. I lost you for a bit, so... Uh, okay, I'm back. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now, but I lost the last part. Uh, yeah, if we imagine, for example, 10, 10 million years, that's a lot of years. Yeah, we can get that, and we, we can get there, and it is a good idea to work on it when it is uh, financially, commercially viable. And the batteries will definitely become more uh, financial, uh, uh, commercially viable. Um, the idea I have a problem with it is that he is selling it as something that makes fossil fuel obsolete. They are not yet, and maybe we are not even close to that. And getting subsidies. Yeah, we might to... not be. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's part of, you know, the hope. And we might be completely, we might be completely wrong, but I don't, but I, mm -hmm. I, I don't think we'll be further away. Right. So I think we're at least going to be closer. Um, we just don't know what's going to happen. And uh, yeah, subsidies is a tough one. I mean, a lot of the climate narrative stuff is a tough one, but I mean, there are problems with the way we treat the environment, right? Like I think pollution, mm -hmm. microplastics, like dumping stuff into the ocean, like like some of those things, those are like legit, those are problems you probably don't even realize how bad they are. I don't even know if the car, the sure. the climate, you know, CO2 is even a thing. Part of me feels like from some of what I've seen, that's it's actually just all hype. But you know, I don't know, we just don't know. Uh and I think historically, if you look through the evolution of civilization and human nature, the free market entrepreneurs, innovators, the, they are always the ones that moves us, move us forward through technology. Mm -hmm. It's never the state. It's never, it's never subsidies though. Subsidies might help at some certain times, whatever, but usually entrepreneurs create amazing products and innovations in spite of the government. <laughs> and usually the government is the ones trying to everywhere, right? Walmart was attacked. All of these innovative companies that came in and disrupted industries, which we know today made the world a better place, they were always attacked early on. And so I, you know, I don't think, um, I don't think it's any different with any other industry. I think space travel is going to take a very long time, uh, but mm -hmm. there's going to be a space race. There's going to be a space industry. We're talking, multi, we're talking trillions of dollars of, of value. And when we can effectively acquire resources from space, I mean, you're talk, we're talking like unlimited resources. We're never going to want for anything. We could just use fossil fuels forever and we can make it, pull it out of what's available in our solar system. And if we, maybe we figure out a way to like do that profitably and clean and maybe some combination of that and plus like big solar, like solar farms in space that beam energy down or whatever. Like there's just stuff we can't even fathom that's possible when we can escape gravity and we can start thinking about the human species as in, as a living in, in the solar system rather than living on earth, right? Then it's a completely different ball game. And most of what our scarcity mindset are around climate is or around scarcity or around population, most of that is because we can't profitably escape gravity. When we can profitably mm -hmm. escape gravity and there's an actual need for that. I mean, we're talking like the ability to support trillions of humans while also probably turning earth into like a freaking paradise of perfection. Like, cause then we can just like do all these things in space and we can just ship off waste and do like, or, or maybe we reuse waste. Like th everything is solved through innovation technology. Right. And when you think about any advanced alien civilization that in all the sci-fi movies, when they invade us and they have these amazing things that can travel intergalactic space, whatever, all of that is possible. I believe it is absolutely possible over a given enough, a long enough period of time. Right. And so it's hard to think like, what might happen in 500 years, a thousand years. Uh, but I don't know. I do believe that we will get there because everything around us is just a mixing of atoms in a certain way. And we 
as just what we've been able to do and we haven't even tapped into the potential for artificial intelligence when that I mean, that could actually be a real threat to, threat to us, to be honest. But when that, when there's an AI explosion and AI can like do all this crazy computation on its own and experimenting on its own, and we'll even eventually have robots that can literally do experiments with technology on its own, like, and it can learn and self-learn, like it will just be absolutely insane. Uh, so we just have to make sure we don't blow ourselves up first <laughs> before we get there. But I'm mm-hmm. very pro-future, pro-humanity and pro-technology. And that's why, you know, someone like Elon or Bezos or whatever, like, they're all going to have their flaws because they're just men and they're all going to benefit from the corona capitalism that is alive today. Uh, but that's true of all of us. We all benefit in some way. Like we all benefit in wherever we're at in whatever way compared to someone else. Uh, and, you know, it's just, it's just part of the system. And that's why we got to keep doing what we're doing. That's why Bitcoin is such an equalizer because Bitcoin like literally makes it fair for everybody and it removes the power yeah. of the state and crony capitalism and crony politics. Like, and it brings the power back to the people, which is why to me, it's the most important thing I've ever seen in my lifetime, like literally in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. And I think very few people understand that. Yeah. Uh, and it is in line with the uh, raise your point about subsidies, for example, subsidies might help, yeah. might help for the governments to, uh, to, to finance something that is, not commercially viable, not financially viable. I don't know the exact term, which one. Same, it's the same thing, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they might invest in it. They might succeed in doing it, but at the ex- expense of many people uh, losing their livelihood. But uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs do it in a way that it is at the right time and at the right cost, and they make it available to everyone. And in line with what you said about mining other planets, other uh, mining the space and using the resources there, well, there are planets that are full of methane and we will never run out of that. So that's a good idea to get and to find a way to get there. I am. I also agree that it's going, if given the, you know, uh, given enough uh, number of years, we would get there. Maybe we, uh, maybe we even get to more efficient way, ways of producing and using energy that we don't even need that. That I also can yep. I- imagine. Yep. Yeah. So we have covered uh, some good aspects of the, uh, this discussion. Do you have anything else to add? And I, I know you, you want to run. Uh. Well, we were talking about Elon, we were talking about the space subsidies, free markets. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think another prin- another kind of point or principle on free markets is that most, like America has brought more prosperity to humanity and more people than any government or state in the history of the world. That's because of are mostly free market. And we started out as a very free market, mm-hmm. very libertarian. And then over time, it's it's coalesced into like more centralization as these things tend to go. But even today, you know, aside from all the kind of zombie companies and like the banks that get bailed out, like the financial sector, like a lot of the industries that are very heavy, heavily regulated are also the ones that are bailed out because they're not allowed to fail. And then it be, they basically become intertwined with government. And that's what mm-hmm. fascism is. Fascism is actually government and, and corporations running together basically. Uh, and outside of that though, there are a lot of industries that don't get any subsidies. Like, and a lot of us small business owners, entrepreneurs like myself that are just like, we start something from an idea, provide a good and service to the planet. We use those resources to reinvest and grow and build things and create all the while paying the state taxes and paying the regulatory fees and doing everything we can to get, get them out of our business, but them still trying to get their tentacles in. And that state, that government, all that corn- capitalism all of that growing centralization of power feeds off of us productive entrepreneurs and in, in a lot of ways even pe- pe- uh, people like elon like you don't do what elon's done on pure subsidies maybe it's a bootloader like mm-hmm. maybe it even helps you at a rough patch when they were like really struggling you know i mean he paid all the money back by the way and he and he paid it off i believe faster than he had to right but you he's still providing so much net value to what to human Look at 
they create a sick. I mean, you know, you mentioned carnivore, like that's a huge racket right there. Uh, what about subsidies with big pharma? I mean, big pharma is literally not liable for the products that they make if it's called mm -hmm. a vaccine, right? Because the government wants them to make them and they would refuse to make them if there was liability because they would kill too many people. But because the government intervened, we now have the craziness of 2020, the vaccine mandates and all this just stupid absurdity that they've seen. That is a direct exam. Uh, it's a direct byproduct of government and, and uh, the market, the government intervening in the market, right? As Saylor says, all government regulation or involvement creates inflation. So it's just, an, it's just mm -hmm. another way that inflation is created because it distorts markets. It keeps companies that don't belong to stay alive. It keeps them alive, keep, creates zombie companies. There's all this fake free money floating around. And the fact that Elon is doing that mostly out of those very controlled uh, markets, that's a big thing, right? Like, I don't think there was any subsidies for space. He did that mostly on his own. And as far as EV stuff goes, he's he kind of also paved the way. So all these other car companies are benefiting now. But I, I think that's going to be a net good because I think it's going to have more investment in that space. And there might be some crazy innovations we can't even imagine that come out of it. Uh, also investing more in satellites and like bringing broadband to, to the earth, to every person on the planet. That's actually another way, very closely aligned with Bitcoin of how bringing Bitcoin to the masses is going to require internet connectivity. So bringing internet connectivity mm -hmm. to the masses is going to help accelerate Bitcoin, but it's going to bring freedom and, and, and it's going to bring VPNs and it's going to bring a way for people to get information that's not filtered through their government and the propaganda, whatever. Like, so it's like, these are other maybe byproducts of companies that he's done with Tesla that are going to bring maybe more prosperity through that. And a lot of people are saying that his buying of Twitter, if he makes it truly free speech, will actually have a bigger impact on humanity than his electric vehicles. And I actually believe that, right? Like mm -hmm. that itself could be a, the single greatest thing he does in his lifetime that will have repercussions for generations to come, right? And that was made possible through EVs. So sometimes, you know, like one plus one might not equal two, but like one plus one plus one plus one plus one. and i like the market still does reward it even when there's a lot of crony uh, i can still i can hear you but i lost a, a few with, with a few when you yeah, were doing that calculation yeah, yeah. i stopped um yeah. so um, i guess the, to close the point it was the market still does reward mostly mm -hmm. Not, not for all industries, like airline, big pharma, food, like some of these industries that are heavily regulated and heavily yeah. subsidized. The free market doesn't really reward those. The, it's more crony capitalism that rewards those markets. But like space exploration, even cars, um, like internet, these other things that he's doing, the mm -hmm. free market still does on a net basis reward value you provide. So if you're providing value to the marketplace, which is giving people what they want and getting them products and services, making their lives better, you get rewarded. And that's why Bezos and Musk, two of the richest people on the planet, uh, they got there by mostly providing value. And if they got help along the way, or if they were, you know, benefiting from certain subsidies along the way, I mean, I would, I would have, if it helped accelerate what I was trying to do. And if it, it helped me stay alive when I needed to or whatever. So yeah, I just think we got to think a little bit bigger picture and analyze all the different things. And nobody should look at a, a single man and assume he's got it all figured out because nobody does. Yeah, one qu quick thing that actually this is at, at the end of our conversation. I know uh, we are running out of time, but this is an important issue that we should have talked about earlier. And this Twitter th thing, uh, I, because of what I have seen, uh, his, uh, what I uh, saw him do with Bitcoin, for example, buy it and then hold it. And also at the same time, uh, criticize it for uh, making the earth warm, I am worried that if he gets Twitter, he does the same thing. So I try to be very concise here and very brief so that if you have a, a counter argument, you can bring it up. So you'll think, you think if he, if you'll get Twitter, he'll do he, the same thing? He would do the same thing, that he would cave into the mainstream narrative and he would start cooperating with them because there's a lot of uh, conflict of interest. Well, I guess we have to think about what that would entail. I mean, he doesn't sell information. He's not a media company. He doesn't have any involvement whatsoever in like airline, tra like travel that way. It's all private stuff. Um, 
and he's a big proponent of, of freedom of speech. Like the thing about freedom of speech is that it gives him the right to criticize Bitcoin one day and, and to buy it the next day and talk about how he bought it. Like, and I think that's completely fine. I don't, I don't, I think that if anything, it accelerates the discussion about it. Us Bitcoin maximalists, maybe we've done the work, maybe we've researched mining, maybe we've divin- we've dived into the climate narrative. Like just because we have a healthy understanding of all these things does not mean that 99.99% of the planet does. Most people don't. Most people think climate change is bad. Most people think EV cars are probably better for the environment, you know, and everything in between. And so if he gets Twitter and his core ethos is freedom of speech, you know, like he can say whatever he wants, but the counterpoint is so can we, and so can everyone else. Right. And so it's, but i just think he genuinely believes freedom of speech matters and so i i I don't think that would happen but if it does happen it happens and if he makes a mistake he learns from it like he's generally the type to learn and grow right and that's what every entrepreneur has to do like you try things as an entrepreneur and i guarantee you every entrepreneur your ideas are not all great (laughs) that's Mm -hmm. how you get to good ideas you try bad ones and you lose money and you lose market share and some people make fun of you that's all part of the process just like when you're a kid and a teenager and like you're awkward and like you do things and you say stupid shit and people make fun of you like this is the evolutionary process right so i guess we just have to see i I, i'm very like i believe it's going to be way better than who's currently running it and if not maybe maybe a new company comes out of it. Maybe we start a new one or maybe he, sh- I mean, he shuts it down. Maybe he starts, shuts it down and says, let's just start from, fre- from scratch. Like who knows? I mean, anything could happen, but anything that takes away the power from those currently benefiting from the crony narrative, you know, all like the blue check marks, the mainstream media, the government, they're all, it's all fascism at this point. They're all in bed together. They all scratch each other's back. They all have certain things you'll say and you don't say. They all have, have advertisers that will advertise with you if you're this. Big Pharma pays for this. So anything that gets in the middle of that and breaks that up a little bit or at least starts causing some problems, I'm all for because I think that's part of the evolutionary process to kind of weed out the, the bad and let the market decide. I, I would have regretted uh, that I didn't bring up this uh, Twitter issue in, uh, during this com- uh, conversation, and I'm glad that we could bring it up and talk about it. I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you once again for doing this in- interview. It was uh, really a really great great uh, talk. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having Thanks me. For coming. Yeah, no worries.